What have eagles, doves, peacocks and owls, as well as a cafe outside a square, an RTO, registered training organisation, and a charity all got in common? There's one answer, and that is Andrew Cole. He's my next guest on the Moving Beyond Being Good podcast. Let's go. Hi folks, welcome to the Moving Beyond Being Good podcast by Gary Ryan from Organisations That Matter. In this podcast, Gary shares everything about servant leadership, service leadership, authentic leadership, how to create high performance cultures, service excellence, and life balance. Here's your host, Gary Ryan. Thank you, Sienna, for your lovely introduction. Always, folks, we've got Andrew Cole here, who's got three businesses. We're going to touch base on all three. Welcome, Andrew. G'day, Gary. How are you going? I'm going great. It's great to be uh, catching up with you yet again. We have yes. some long conversations from time. Usually one of us is traveling, if not both of us, when we do that. So we're both stationary this time. I was going to say, I'm uh, in my office and it looks like you're in yours, which is good. So. It certainly is. So with Tick Concepts, AWC Solutions and Food at the Table, let's, let's start with Tick Concepts. And what is it about and what does it do? Well, I mean, that's where we met, you know, I'm going to say nearly 20 years ago, you know, and... And TIC is a terrific, you know, profiling tool, as you know, and, um, you know, using the bird analogies, you know, which is the the eagle, the peacock, the dove and the owl, which um, which has been around, can I say, for about 40 years now, which I don't know if you know the full history, but, um, you know, Desi Hunt, who uh, was the author, you know, wrote it in the 1980s. And, um, and it's funny, it's such a good tool. I fell in love with it when I was doing some training and some leadership. I was working with, with DISC and with... Um, uh, with Myers Briggs and a few others, and you know, next thing you know, I feel that I found this tool that everyone sort of got, and people remembered it, and it was simple. And and next thing you know, it's that tool that you know can be used to understand yourself and others. And um, anyway, I was a customer of Des's, and um, we got to know each other a little bit over time. And uh, when he was retiring, we did a bit of a deal, and I did some work with him. And next thing you know, I said, "What are you doing with your books and your profiles?" I said, "They can't retire with you." And uh, and so I bought that in 2007. There you go. So, wow. uh, so 18th so, year now, that means. Yeah, yeah. So it's been uh, been good back then. It was paper. Back to the old profiling tools that were all paper. And now uh, we do still have a few people that use paper, but fundamentally it's, uh, you know, 90 plus percent of people do the online version, which is obviously the ones that you use. So yeah, we made, the, made the, a few changes. The online ones take, you know, most people 10, maximum 15 minutes to do, which is nice and short and sharp. And, I think, as you mentioned, one of the reasons why I've enjoyed the tick tool over time is the four birds. You just you just have to think about the bird, and you can think of what personality comes with that. You think of the peacock. Peacock. I mean, it's flashy, and it's it's out there. It's look at me. Well, okay. From a human being point of view, it's not hard to sort of translate that across. And you think of the owl sitting there taking everything in. Again, quite the opposite. But it's understandable for the people that haven't necessarily done university degrees and dived into a, those sorts of concepts. To me, it's the usability of it that's been the best part. And I would agree. You know, people um, people get it, you know. And Des, I don't know if you know, Des was a carpenter by trade. So Des, Des was a carpenter. He had his kids by the time he was 20. He's got two lovely daughters. Desi died, you know, about nine years ago. And um, I'm still in contact with his family. He's still got this lovely relationship with his wife, Val, who's still alive, and uh, his two daughters. But Des was a builder and, you know, did that for quite a few years. And by the time he was 35, his kids were getting a bit older. And he said, I like people more than I like building. And uh, so I went back and studied psychology and business and, and started writing. And, um, and again, it's brilliant, the simplicity. And he, here's a story that... Um, I can remember, you know, with some of my clients, and you've got long-standing clients, anyway, I'm working with a group, and I said, oh, has anyone done any training with me? Nah, nah. So they don't remember me. I said, oh, I did a bit of communication stuff in your apprentice, with some apprenticeships in this place. You know, now you're in the leadership, so it's probably, you know, five to eight years ago. People go, oh, the birds, yeah, I remember the peacocks. So... I say, I've got feelings, you know. <laughs> you know. They don't remember me, but they remember the birds, which is the stuff that I love because then people say, hey, I was serving this peacock the other day at my shop and they start thinking of it in real time. And can I say, I don't 
have stories where people, you know, people find it interesting, you know, doing any sort of profiling and I'll use disc and Myers Briggs and stuff like that. But uh, remembering in real time is the stuff that I just think is, is terrific and the, and the simplicity and the brilliance of what, uh, what Desi did. So, uh, so yeah. Yeah. I think you comment about real time and that, that is the real value. Is it as scientific as some of those other tools? Probably not. Well, well, possibly not, but it, but it's interesting. I mean, you give me a tool, Gary. I can come out whatever you like, you know. And you know, I'd get challenged by people. You could do the same. Put your Dove Owl hat on, and you can come out there, and I can think and act exactly that way, and etc. Um, you know, this is people being, um, you know, understanding themselves. You know, and the only way in my mind, which is what Des did. You know, we're on the sixty fifth version of the tool. You know, that he went through for the first ten years. He went through thousands of an, of analysis, and I think you've probably seen the stats. But you know, it's about eighty five percent. You know, you take the bell curve, and you know, you take the top ninety three percent. So you cut off the bottom seven, and uh, you know, they agree with eighty five percent of the descriptive words that he puts in the profile. So people have answered the questions, and then people have analysed that. And he went through a very long process, you know, doing that. So, you know, but I always say to people, if they're if they're not into that, just try it, try it, have a go, try it, see if it's going to fit your business. Because as you know, different tools for different things, and uh, and in the people, the communication, and all that sort of stuff, and and you've seen it, it's it's just terrific, you know. Yeah. So. And that, to me, again, that's the point, though. It's the it's the memorability. People remember it. They go, okay, yeah, it makes sense. You know, they just have to hear the first four birds again, and it's, oh, that's right, I remember now. And and as you also described, in real time, people can go, ah, oh, this person's more like a peacock. They're more like an eagle. Uh, they're more. I can see that they've got a bit of eagle and they've got a bit of dove in them, like which is interesting because that's a, yeah. a diagonal com combination, right? And they can, but they can pick it up. Uh, yeah. No. Absolutely. I mean, I've got this lovely story. It's a lovely little video on our website of a of a, a department at Adelaide Uni. You know, so we've got universities and TAFEs and schools and consultants like yourself and and all this sort of stuff that use it. But uh, a lovely little video we've got on the website um, is a woman at Adelaide Uni. She works in the career space. They've got a team of about forty. So you know, when people start in a job, they get an induction. You know, here's your job. Here's your KPIs. We go around. Here's Gary. Here's Andrew. All that. They've got their, this poster, they've got the poster on the wall, you know, with everybody's profiles and everybody does a profile that the, you know, the, you don't need a psychologist to, to translate it and all the rest of it. But they sit in front of that poster and they say, right, here's the people you can use this, but here's the people, here's the loud ones and here's the quiet ones. And these ones are really task focused and these ones, you know, love a chat a bit too much and all the rest. But if you think of what happens in a workplace, people take months to work that stuff out. Why is he so quiet? Why doesn't he talk to me? Is he being rude? You know, it's his natural persona and it's okay, but it sometimes takes months. So therefore that part of the process, she says, is far more, yeah, correct, is far more valuable in a time sense. And for the few dollars it costs to buy a profile, it speeds that process up by months and gives them a tool in real time to use. And I just think it's terrific, you know, and uh, can, you know, all that stuff that we all do, you know, when we meet people for the first time. So. Yeah, and anything in business where we can compress time, mm. that is super valuable. Oh, and, and the communication piece, as you know, you can be the best whatever, but if you can't communicate that to anybody, then we have a problem, right? I had a, an aunt who was in hospital on the weekend, and and I love the Ambos, right? The Ambos are one of my favourite profession, you know, profession. They turn up with a sense of calmness anyway. And Auntie needed a bit of help. So we and and this one guy, he was terrific, you know, at just uh, communicating. And then you see the different um, professionals, the, the nurses and the doctors that come, and some are very, very good at it and some aren't. I don't know what their qualifications are, but some just make you feel comfortable mm. and have that beautiful demeanour and others don't. Mm. It's what I want my kids to learn. It's what I want everybody to learn. Because as you know, you can be the best technician in any trade or field. Um, but you, people just don't like working with you. Yeah. You don't get the people side. Mm, because And usually that's because they haven't invested any time actually understanding themselves and understanding their impact. I mean, which flows into the emotional intelligence side of things. So these tools significantly help people with their emotional intelligence and how they're impacting the people around them. And I'm interested as to how that's flowed into AWC solutions. Oh, yeah, in interesting. So, so I don't know, I'll give you, here you go, the 30 second history of Andrew Cole at 55. First 10 years I worked for Nestle. 
you know, in a sales and, and leadership role. I grew up in Adelaide. I'm back in Adelaide, you know, but spent a few years in Sydney. So there was my first 10 years, so sales and, and, and leadership. And then I came back, had my first midlife crisis, you know, late 20s, didn't know what I needed to do. And then I started consulting and training and someone said, hey, you, you're not bad at this. What what else can you do? So I was just talking. I think I might have been talking customer service. And I said, what other topics do you got? Because I reckon I can communicate and this sort of stuff. Anyway, and um, so I started doing that. And then I started contracting to a couple of RTOs, you know, registered training organizations with some accreditations and this sort of stuff. And so I was contracting to them and getting some reasonable feedback and all the rest. 20 odd years ago, there was a lot of funding around for training. Mm. And so I was just getting into that space. I'd sort of met Des Hunt and then I was doing contracting work for for training organizations and i thought you know what i reckon there's a summer project for you andrew see if you can create yeah exactly create a uh, an rto yourself and so that was in 2003 and so just 21 years ago and um and so i did so summer where as you know people go on holidays people got christmas it's a bit light on for consultants like you and i and so that was a summer project and by the end of summer, I'd been accredited and and come up with this status that um, that I've kept for 20 years. And it's been such a good business model, you know. And there was funding, which is one of my reasons. I didn't really think that people would really like the uh, certificates as much as they do. But there are a lot of people that I deal with who are very happy. So getting a certificate three. So we've got a certificate three in business to business sales a certificate four in management, a diploma of leadership and management. And so there's different levels. It works really nicely as a model. And again, we, we, we get groups of people at about the same level and we train them in real life skills. And there's a return on that, you know, and, and now there's, there's no real funding and different RTOs do that. As you can see, I don't have much hair. So I, uh, <laughs> I can't deal with all the different state bodies and all the rest of it. But my philosophy is I need to provide a return for my clients. And so if we do that through this training, then they keep coming back. And I've got plenty of longstanding clients yes. that um, every year they come back and we do present, you know, we get people presenting and presenting what they've done through the year. It's action-based learning, you know, change projects and improvements, saving time and making money and sales projects and all the rest. So at the end of it, it's paid for itself no end. So I probably should put my prices up. You can coach me in that. <laughs> However, however, I definitely can. I definitely yeah. can. How, however, it's just been it's been a terrific tool, and um, and yeah, so that's been that's been going for twenty odd years. And AWC, this is how creative I am, Andrew William Cole. You can work it out. I just discovered something that's uh, similar between the both of us. Then what's that? Our middle name. Oh, there you go. I'm Famous. a as well. <laughs> there you go. I did not know that about you. <laughs> there you go. Well, see, I say AWC. It's my business. You can probably guess my middle name. And W, most people, you know, first or second guess, I'll get a William. So uh, there you go. I haven't, yeah. got as, I haven't got as many siblings as you. So uh, <laughs> that's true. Good memory on that. <laughs> I did really well because that's actually my father's, my grandfather's name on my dad's what? side. So it's amazing that his name was still available by the time I came. Well, that's what I would have thought in your numbers. It's, it's my grandfather's name on mum, mum's side. There you go. So, yeah, yeah. so there you go. Yeah, that's a great similar. My families work, hey? It's amazing how families work. And uh, certainly our five children, their first and second names all have a story behind why why they've got what they've got. So uh, yeah, we, nice. we wanted them to tap into some some of their ancestry and, and make sure they've got those connections across both our, uh, well, our Australian, English, Irish, and Sri Lankan uh, culture, cultural heritages in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, we oh, have, good. Yeah, good, yeah. yeah. No, no, it's, um, so again, so there's, there's the AWC story, I suppose, that has been doing that. And then, um, and, you know, we've, I reckon I've had up to about eight staff, you know, and um, and I'm actually in the process, I'm probably going to uh, end up closing AWC over the next, you know, year or two. And, um just the, just the way my life's changing and my kids are growing up and, you know, probably do some, cons almost the full circle, go back to, I'm going to still be doing TIC, but then um, uh, some contract training, you know, and go back and take some of those courses, probably still work with the same clients, you know, and um, and do that work. So, um, so yeah, so it's, a, it's an interesting time, you know, when I get to 50s and all the kids are, you know, youngest is about to turn 21 and, um you know, I look at that and think, um, let's reassess and, and continue to challenge and what's, what the things that are right for me and Kelly. So, so yeah, it's good. Well, well, four years ago, you did 
take a shift in in focus um, mm. with your becoming a director of Food on the Table. Correct. Yeah. You want to tell, you want to tell the audience about what Food on the Table is. Why? Yeah. And really, why Food on the Table? Well, it's well, it's interesting. So, Food on the Table. It started. I've probably been the director for about five years, but it was a um, it's a charity that is a it's a food charity. In fact, we've just had our major fundraiser. We'll get to that. But I um, uh, it used to be called Cafe Outside the Square. We ran a cafe and we were outside a place in Adelaide called Whitmore Square. And Whitmore Square has a lot of homelessness around it, and there's a lot of support agencies there. So we ran a charity where and two friends of mine started it, and um, one of them is a guy that I went to uni with, and. Um, so anyway, they did that for a you know a couple of years, and then um, and I'd been fundraising for them. And they asked me to become a director. So we were running a cafe, trying to help train people and then provide food. And <laughs> here you go, you've uh, lived through COVID like I've lived through COVID. And um, so we had a cafe, you know, hospo business going through COVID. So we effectively had to close the cafe. Mm. We thought that we were going to close the whole thing because. Um, uh, how are we going to pay for things and all the rest? Job keeper came along, and um, and we'd also had our rent paid, so we had rent paid, and we had two staff. It also so that's where the, our soup kitchen really took off, and um, it kept a lot of people sane. So we were allowed to keep a, a food agency open, but we weren't allowed to have a cafe. Okay. So so again, lots of volunteers, and anyway, we scratched around and and uh, got enough money to get our ingredients, and next thing you know, we're providing a whole lot more food. Adelaide, because we're not quite like Victoria, we had about four days of full lockdowns, <laughs> two hundred and seventy or whatever. But um, so we so we had that, but but again, there was lots of restrictions, as you know, and so therefore, you know, that really helped. And so then when we came out of that, we were just getting better and better at that. When our lease came up, you know, we were sharing a lease with somebody, and we needed to um, really get a new premises, which we did eighteen months ago, October. 18 months, whatever that was. Yep. And um, so we moved. And so we, we had this name called Cafe Outside the Square and we weren't a cafe anymore and we weren't outside Whitmore Square in Adelaide. So we changed it to what we actually do. And now a huge focus is getting food out to people. And, um, and we're pretty proud. I mean, we've been growing and growing and growing and how we add value, we, we take ingredients and we make them into hearty meals. And then we give them away through other charities. So, you know, some places do canned stuff and, and, and all the rest of it. But where we add value is mm -hmm. by, by doing that. And we're just growing this lovely community. And there's probably two halves to it. And they cross over a bit um, is our volunteers. It's a simple uh, model. The more, more people we've got to chop up food, uh, the better. And, um, and so there's, there's our food side. And that's been growing really nicely. And then we've got our fundraising side. But on the food side, we've literally, we, we um, I'm looking at the date on the bottom where it's the 11th of June. We have just gone through 100,000 meals that we've given away this financial year. And wow. uh, well, stuff, that, yeah, yeah, you know what? And and I'm, I'm a part of it. You know, I'm a director, but I'm a volunteer director. That's my volunteering. We do have um, some paid staff. We've got two full-timers. We've got a chef who oversees all the food. And so... He's got a real job. He's got a real family and bills and all the rest. And we take that fairly seriously. We've got a general manager and uh, she's the same full time. And then we've got a couple of part timers, volunteer coordinator and an events coordinator. Because now our, our financial model is we've got a fundraise and we actually rent a place. It's got a big commercial kitchen and it's got a big hall. It's a community hall. And uh, so we rent that out for events. And um, there you go. Anyone in Adelaide? renters look us up food on the table and um and again you know we need a fair bit of dough to, to do that we get no government funding a couple of us including me have signed a lease and uh so therefore you know we've got a fair bit of skin in the game so to speak for no financial return but yeah i am spending more time on that and it's pretty rewarding it's probably putting all of the skills that we've learned over years of um of running businesses um into play and uh, there's too many good people out there gary that I'm slowly meeting more and more of that want to give time and money and resources and, you know, et cetera, you know, and there's plenty of examples. Give you, give, give you a couple. So we had a problem. We're getting more, we're getting corporate groups. I don't know if where you are, but we've got corporate groups, you know, good, um, you know, socially minded corporates who give people a day off, say, for, for volunteering. So we have corporate groups coming through. 
we have school groups and we do education pieces in that and all this. So we've got these lovely stories around, you know, where corporates get together and have a good team bonding thing and make some money, make some meals and all the rest. Same with kids, you know, high school kids and Duke of Edinburgh kids and uh, primary school kids coming through. Chop, chop, chop. And next thing you know, they've made 500 sausage rolls or little takeaways of pasta and, and all this sort of stuff. Um, and they raise some money. We had these problems where we were outgrowing our freezer space and the staff, and I oversee the food production, right, as part of my responsibility. And they said, we've got to slow people down. We're shortening the days. I've gone, tell me why, why? We haven't got the freezer space. We're, we're making too much food. I'm like, so what do we need? These are the best problems to have. Yeah, exactly. We can, I can find people because, as you know, the cost of living and powers and rents and mortgages and all that have gone crazy at the moment. So the stories that we hear are, you know, really, really tough. And so I said, we've got to do some stuff. So I just started cold calling people. There you go. Sales 101. Yeah. Hey, we need some freezer space. So I found this terrific family run company who doesn't want any publicity. So I'll just say there's a guy called Tom. But anyway, um, and um, he said, hey, we've got some freezer space and it's 10 minutes from where we are. So, you know, now we've got places to store food. We've got refrigerated trans, yeah, exactly, refrigerated transport people that will take it for us. And we've got all this stuff. And again, you just ask people. And, and to me, all of that is just, I suppose, a you know, it's a combination of all the skills that we've learned for 30 odd years. And how do you solve these? I don't know, but let's, let's try and fix it. I've never, I don't want to own refrigeration. I don't know, but I got a good network and away we go. So, so yeah, so it's, so it's a really good mix and a nice balance for me um, with, um, you know, with work. And I, I mean, I just treat it like work. It's unpaid work. If I can work three or four days, you know, training and there's weeks that I'm busy and there's weeks I'm not so busy and I can put more time in and less time and yeah. juggle, juggle your time and away we go. So, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's very interesting and, uh, and, reward, and rewarding. Oh, we can, we can all see, feel and hear the passion mm. coming out of you, Andrew, uh, as you talk about this and, and just the, the way you, even your whole face is lit up. Uh, as it did for Tick and yeah. AWC as well, but I can really feel this. So when when your friend from university initially tapped you on the shoulder, mm -hmm. you, you weren't doing this. You, you weren't involved, and it was called Cafe on the Square at the time. But what 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 was the why for you that got you to go, okay, I'll get involved? Here you go. I'll tie Tick into this too. I think it's probably my dove, you know, and – and as much as I, I say this to doves in training sessions, I say, you know, you, you're all self-centered beings, right? Why do you do it? You do it because it makes you feel good, right? And uh, and I've been fundraising uh, for for Mike, this friend of mine, and raising money and donations and stuff. And we've done, you know, some different events prior. And, um, and, and him and uh, Tim, another guy who started it, they were looking to expand the board. And they said, hey, you've been a supporter. Would you be interested in getting a bit, your hands a bit dirty? <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, so, so we did. And, um, so yeah, so that, that's probably where it started. And, um, it felt like a natural progression, you know, probably where I was at, who I am as a person and, and those sorts of things. So I did. So for the first couple of years, I, I was hands on volunteer coordinator and literally trying to get people. And we, we started, we've got these three volunteers that we call the three musketeers. Two of them are still, you know, heavily involved. And, uh, yeah, exactly. And, um, so they came. And they, particularly through COVID, they were really core. Cool. One of them's actually in the symphony orchestra in Adelaide. And um, same as all the rest of us. She played in front of crowds and travelled around the place playing music, right? So it kept her sane and gave her stuff to do. So, um, you know, next thing you know, all these beautiful people that come from all these uh, weird and wonderful, diverse backgrounds come together. We've got retirees, we've got associations with international students at the unis and at schools, and and you just have these lovely conversations, you know, around it. So, uh, so yeah, so that's, that's where it started. And then as we slowly are growing, that's where um, probably for the last two years, I can't remember now exactly, but of two years and a bit, maybe someone else has been doing the hands-on. I mean, keep in mind, I get these messages. I'm training people. I'd, hey, I can't turn up for volunteering and all the rest. I'm like, oh, hell. <laughs> so life was a bit busy there for a little bit when I'm training groups around Australia and whatever. So, so yeah, and um, and it's and it's grown and continue to growing. And uh, and again, it's a anyway, it, it, it it's a good thing. I can see it just continuing to grow. I mean. 
if we can make, I'll just use South Australia as a, as a better place. You know, we've got city, we've got two regions in the country that we deliver to. And again, we've been asking for transport. We've been making connections and, and, and just growing. And, you know, it's not a hard one when you think, um, you know, we've got some food, you know, have you got people in your community? Let's find some people, you know, so you find community leaders and mm. find the biggest areas. Then we've got to set some systems up, you know, again, with transport and fr uh, frozens and, um, and I'm no expert in fresh food, but that's where cane comes in. But again, you think of food rotation and keeping it safe and all the rest of it. So we've got to make sure that we're we're compliant in all those areas. So yeah, it's 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 got its, it's got its challenges, but it's very rewarding. And you, look, a hundred thousand meals over the past twelve months, and that does require funds. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you know you, you've got a record year of fundraising. Uh, this this podcast is global. Mm. put the links in the chat but people can people can contribute at any time is that accurate correct you know and if you go to our website there's places for donations but but we've run this thing um we created it here you go here's another example we created a thing called soup and sleep right one of the first participants called it soup or sleep which was kind of funny <laughs> because we had a, we had an event we needed we anyway we had a couple of things that would change and we needed to raise some dough so we created an event and um and what we do is we have it's a food based uh night and we've just run ours I'll, I'll tell you the story with numbers in a second but we um we just run it and we run it in june you know most fundraising happens sort of may and june each year heading into tax time and for us you know a lot of our people we support people who are homeless you know through different agencies and women who've come out of domestic violence situations and schools that have got kids that are hungry and and all this so there's plenty of reward right but we needed some money so we created this thing food based it's a bit of education it's a bit of a bit of food a bit, a bit of chopping and and that sort of stuff and then a bit of entertainment and auction and all the rest of it so it's a fun night and then we sleep out so we sleep out so last week we slept in our car park and we've slept in different places over the last four years so we started it four years ago in uh, in june 2021 and we raised 150 grand and uh, we thought we were so excited. Um, back then there was myself, Mike and Tim, and um, we were really pleased with that. And we've gone, and that just takes a big easing off the financial, uh, you know, costings. Yes. And um, fast forward, then uh, three years ago, we made 220. Last year, we made 300. And as so we ran it last, so um, it's the 11th of June today. We ran it on the 6th of June last Thursday. We ran through 300 on the night. We're currently at 340,000. We probably, from our tracking, will probably end up very high threes, 370 to 390, we reckon. <laughs> exactly. And we thought only three weeks ago, if we matched last year, I mean, it's tough out there. Mm. But we've got to, we actually, you know, it's an all inclusive. We've got school groups, we've got corporate groups, we've got family groups, we've got whatever. You know, teenagers are coming, parents and kids and all the rest of it. And um, we had, I think we've got something like 270 uh, registered fundraisers and um, about 50 of them are one particular school group. So, you know, 220, anyway, it's it's massive. And and everyone's just doing this and everyone goes to their networks and, and away we go. So anyway, fundraising 101, but, you know, we've done it and we ran a night last week and there's lots of nice noises that people thought, hang on, you guys are doing a great job. So. Oh, absolutely. So. Well, while we're on the topic, let's let's share the three websites, okay? So we'll start yeah. with food on the table. Yep. So it's uh, that's foodonthetable.org.au. So all one word. So that's that's the charity, and that's <laughs> I get more excited about getting a sale through there, I must say, than I do, you know, again, it's probably a stage of life and you know having worked for thirty or forty years. But um, there's that. Um, the AWC. Uh, business solutions but awc anyway, awc solutions.com.au is uh is the rto and uh and tick and the other one that you know i, I think as i get older you know be more focused on tick and food on the table right but um but tick t-i-c-k very simple domain that desi registered a long time ago and you know what makes people tick and the birds so tick.com.au and and yeah there's there's the three businesses in a uh in a nutshell i reckon so uh interesting interesting journey i reckon when i start thinking about it for the last you know 20 or 30 years um you know with the different different prongs and keeps my life interesting you know i still like training people and helping people in that space so we're going to give up ever i don't know we'll work it out i think it's been pretty obvious to the audience andrew that you've continued to work in 
your area of passion since you had that early midlife crisis when you were about 28 that you said yeah. earlier. And then mm. the willingness and the smarts, in fact, to put your head down and go, okay, over that summer, how can I create my own RTO? How do I do that? And you mm. dedicated your own time, effort and energy. And this is, this is one of the things that people going into business, I think often underestimate is that if you want to be successful, you have to be willing to input time, money and energy, all three mm -hmm. in one form mm -hmm. or another. Now, yeah. the, the same's occurred literally with food on the table as well. So you might not have necessarily put the cash in, but the the money side of it is your your business now and your business knowledge that you've brought as a director and also yeah. your own volunteering in that space. And of course, it's the same in AWC Solutions. So, uh, and tick.com.au. So it's really important that people understand that because often people completely underestimate the effort required to make businesses successful. I would agree. I would agree. I'm going to say you and I have text, texted. Is that the right word? I never, you know, different hours of the day and night over, hey, I need some codes or what about this or what about that, you know? And I, I do talk to people and you would too, I'm sure, who want to go out on their own and just say, oh, I'm just going to wait till I get my long service leave or this and that. I mean, you haven't had a sick day in 20 years. We haven't been paid for one, you know, and uh, and all those and, and holiday pay and all that sort of stuff. So you've just, I agree with you. You know, you've just got to put that time and energy in and, and be prepared for the sacrifices. And if you do like it, then, you know, the upside is you're doing something that you love. You've got control over things and, and some freedom. You know, the downside is sometimes you think, gosh, I'm working awfully hard. <laughs> <laughs> when you're tapping away on your laptop or you're doing your accounts at night or early in the morning or things like that. Um, but it's the stuff that we all do as I suppose the self-employed sector or the small business sector that, um, you know, tries their best to make a living for their families and do stuff that, that they like doing. So, And really, if you're not doing the work, and I say this in inverted commas, really, what are you going to be? You're going to be sitting on the couch watching the box, mm. watching some Netflix series, probably not creating, not, advancing anything really just burning time mm -hmm. uh, not contributing in anything in any way and or you will be out spending your money mm -hmm. and one of the beauties of of being in this space and putting in the time and being prepared to do it again especially when you are passionate about what you do is it just becomes what you do and mm. You know, I you've probably had this some some people challenge me about you know are oh, you a workaholic it's like I love a workaholic. Yeah. <laughs> you know, at the same time, I've got five kids, as you know, and I, I, I haven't been absent from their lives. Yeah. Because one thing the business does is it does give you freedom over your choice of where you're spending your time. Yeah. And and, and I'd agree with that. You'd just work funny hours yeah. you know, in that space. There's, there's times, I reckon if I was challenging myself back to the, the workaholic type stuff, but I, I think it's the ability to switch off, which I'm getting better at as I'm getting older. And, and I reckon being able to think, hey, I don't need to respond to everything in seconds, you know, but but um, being able to then switch off and be present at kids' sport. And, you know, if we both looked at the mirror and said, have there been times when you're at a kid's sporting game and then the phone goes, you go, oh, that's an important client, I'll take the call. And we do. And you think, hang on a second, you know. So I reckon that's that's there's, there's one trade-off that, that I still fight with a little bit but you just think what is it that can um can do that and I, and I think it's that again back to emotional intelligence is being able to say hey i can switch that off and i'm comfortable i mean my business like yours you know probably if someone says hey andrew call me back or i leave a message that says hey i'm on holidays this week i'll call you back next week most people go no worries people get that right yeah um but but there's times when we do oh, i have to respond i have to do this i have to do it really quickly you know so um so anyway, I, I, rec I reckon that's a that's a challenge for the self-employed, but the right mindset and the right people, you know, and again, I don't feel that I've worked, um, you know, too long or too hard, you know, I've enjoyed, you know, enjoyed it most of the time. And I say that, I reckon most jobs, there's, there's a bit of rubbish that you have to deal with that you just think, but if it's that 80-20 rule, that 80% of it is is fun and interesting and stuff that you're engaged in, you know, it's far better if I rewind, it's becoming further distant memories of working for somebody else. You know, and I think I'm unemployable now, you know, from a, and not from a money point of view, but from a conditions point of view, 
I want to have the afternoon off. When did you decide that? Or now? <laughs> I'll do the work tonight or I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it on the weekend or whatever, or I just won't do it. And um, so for me, it's the conditions that just, anyway, they, they suit me anyway, that uh, that fits fits my life. And I think you'd probably be the same. Yeah, you, you invest the time, money and effort, but you, the, what you're buying is freedom over your time. And mm. whether whether we work more hours than other people or not, to be honest, I don't really know. I, I you know, no. I get accused that that's the truth, but the fact is, I control my time. I'm I control my calendar. I'm I'm in charge of when I do yeah. whatever I do. And yeah. so, when it comes to the kids, you know, one of the things that I did to manage that issue of uh, taking phone calls at their sport was I became the coach. I ain't taking any phone calls. <laughs> from the coach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> I had a I had a go business coach. I had a coach for about five years when I first started working for myself. You know, a terrific guy called Wayne. And anyway, he used to tease me a little bit, but but I used to always put my holidays in my calendar. I've still got a very similar process, you know. And so myself and the family, we would sit down and we would try and make a plan. I'd say, guys, let's make a plan and and lock in those times. And to me, when you think when the kids are growing up, it was around school holidays, and I would lock those in because I could always keep saying yes to customers, but that wouldn't have helped my family. And, you know, hey, we're going to go camping. We're going to have a holiday or a few days through school holidays. And um, so in saying that, we would lock them out and then I would work my business around that. And it's been a pretty good philosophy that has worked for me mm. um, and my, my family. And as you know, December, January is quiet for us. So summer holidays. You know, it was lovely. You know, so I could do a little bit of work. We would go to the beach and and all those sorts of things, and and play with the kids at uh, at uh, at school some break. So, so yeah. So from that perspective, a bit of planning, as you know, you're in control of your time. But I put that in, and again, that's been a habit that I've had for a long time. Particularly when I thought, what is it that I'm trying to achieve here? When I started working for myself, and to me, I think that's an important lesson for anybody who's you know going into their own business. You know, always, always say always say yes, and then eventually i don't know be be really hard working and the family really wants to see you and you think hang on i can you know get get my balance right you know and, and work when i don't want to so 100 percent. now we're going to make sure all the links that you've mentioned are in the show notes as well They'll also pop up on the screen as yeah. people have already seen in the conversation we've had i want to thank you for your time and there is one last question for you go what does moving beyond being good mean to you? Hmm. Moving beyond being good. Maybe I'll answer it this way. I, I, I've got a, a phrase that I use in, I'll say, time management. I call it self-management. You know, we manage ourselves, right? And, um, and I say strive for excellence, avoid perfection. All right? And I'm not a perfectionist. And when I'm ta training and coaching in people, there's plenty of people who say, when they're describing themselves, I'm a perfectionist. I say, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And most of them, you know, aren't kind to themselves and all that sort of stuff. And I think, you know, your mindset is so important when it comes to success, you know, we can, whatever that means, you know, but you've got to be clear on that. So to me, it's a really good place to start is to understand what that looks like you know, being kind to yourself and, and rewarding yourself, you know, that perfectionist streak that just says, hang on, I have done a pretty good job and give yourself that pat on the back for, it could be a day of training and coaching, a session, you know, but if we don't do that, as you know, it can be lonely working for yourself. And then at the end of the day, the week, the month, you can say, hey, we have had a good year. I've, I've made some financial targets. I've, I've coached the footy team. The Western Bulldogs might have made the finals. <laughs> the Crows are struggling again. <laughs> But, but, you know, you, you look at it and you just sort of think, hang on. So, you know, and as you know, we all start getting a few more grey hairs. And uh, so if we're not enjoying it along the way, then I don't think uh, then we're doing a good job. So maybe that answers your question. Love it, love it, love it. Strive for excellence, avoid perfection. It's interesting you should say that one because you're familiar with Tom Peters? In yes, but not, not in great detail. Okay, because he, he's always reminded me a bit of Des, to be honest, or Des has reminded me of, of, of Tom. But yeah. that's... That's actually one of Tom's statements. Yeah, okay. The strive yeah. for excellence and avoid perfection. So you, you've quoted him without realising it, no doubt. Uh, and, and just setting high standards. doesn't matter what you do. You yeah. know, you know, 
again, come and chop veggies, you know, be a good person and do that. Come and uh, clean or come and be a coach and, and try and help drive businesses and, and be a senior leader. A lot of your clients would be senior leaders and, and I deal with lots of them and just do a really good job at it, you know, and, you know, and enjoy that ride. So anyway, just uh, one of the, one of my little rules of life. Absolutely. Now, folks, one of the things that's just come out is a new ebook by myself and Alison Wheeler. It's called Mindset Matters Unleash, un Unleash Your Business's Full Potential. Check it out on Amazon. We actually got listed on the debut list of the hot new releases at number three, which we were very, very happy with. It's short, it's sharp, it's to the point. It's for busy professionals. There'll be a link in the show notes for that too. Once again, Andrew, thanks for coming along. And folks, we look to forward to having you join us on the next episode of the Moving Beyond Being Good podcast. Thanks again, Andrew. Thank you, Gary. Okay, bye. There you go. <laughs>